The Fort Fairfield National Bank was chartered number 4781 by the U.S. government in 1892. It served the town of Fort Fairfield for over 20 years from at least two different locations on Main Street. Northern industrialists pressured the U.S. government to create a national banking system in 1863 in order to finance the War of Northern Aggression against the Southern states. The new banks were required to purchase government bonds to the extent of their capital and pledge them to the United States Treasury. They were then allowed to issue artificially created banknote money against them to 90% of their value. This scheme was designed to provide money to fund the war. In 1923, the Fort Fairfield National Bank began construction on a new three-story brick building to comply with the town's recently enacted fire codes. The construction foreman was Frank Murphy, who was also foreman for the new high school building at the time. The bank's building committee was composed of T.E. Hacker, C.A. Powers, and C. Fred Ames. The new building was open for business in mid-November of that year. With the banking operations located on the first floor, the second floor of the new building contained the dental office of Dr. R. H. Schofield in the northwest corner, also the law offices of Trafton and Roberts, the business office of C.A. Powers & Company, and the business office of L.S. Black, the business manager of Aroostook Telephone Company. The Aroostook Telephone Company occupied the entire third floor of the building. During the construction process, the oval window on the front gable at the third floor, which resembles a Victorian-era picture frame, got the attention of one Fort Fairfield youngster, who the Fort Fairfield Review quoted as asking whose picture was going to be placed in it. Fort Fairfield National Bank existed at a time when the U.S. money supply was backed by gold and silver coin, per a U.S. constitutional mandate. No state shall make anything but gold or silver coin, a tender in payment of debts. U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. A mandate still in effect today. But the Federal Reserve allowed more paper money to be printed than there was gold in existence, which ultimately caused a run on the banks in the U.S. as depositors were frantically trying to claim their gold before the supply ran out. This caused the Great Bank Holiday of 1933, where all banks in the U.S. were ordered closed on Friday, March 10th. With the passage of House Joint Resolution 192, Congress abrogated the gold backing of U.S. currency, confiscated all gold from domestic circulation, and with an amendment to the Trading with the Enemy Act, made the possession of gold illegal. The confiscated gold was then replaced with paper Federal Reserve Note IOUs. Over 1,000 banks reopened three days later when they could prove they were solvent in the new IOU money. When the Fort Fairfield National Bank reopened on Monday, their new name was First National Bank of Fort Fairfield. In 1954, the bank had a large staff consisting of Fred Kilburn, Willard Price, Ronald Grant, Marion Ireland, Kay Flannery Finney, Margaret McGuire Johnson, Alice Higgins, and Judy Smith Young. Also around that time, Philip Gee Roberts joined his father's law firm on the second floor, where he remained until relocating across the street in 2005. In the early 1960s, the top floor of the building, once the location of the former Aroostook Telephone Company, now hosted the location of a private businessman's social club called the Boundary Line Club. Steve Toll remembers how his family used the Boundary Line Club's banquet hall over the bank for their annual Thanksgiving Day dinners. Back in those days, the, uh, uh, the Toll family, of course, there was uh, 11 kids in Dad's family. 
And come around Thanksgiving time, there was uh, there was no place big enough to host a so-called Toll family uh, Thanksgiving dinner. So the Boundary Line Club was uh, was an option that we used for a couple of years. And, and again, as a, as a child, I just remember uh, going up with the, the aunts and the uncles and thirty cousins, first cousins from all the uh, all the siblings, and having a. a very enjoyable afternoon with uh, uh, with the food and getting a chance to uh, run around and play with all your first cousins and, and the footage will show the uh, uh, typically the, the ladies occupied the kitchen and home cooking like you can imagine pies and cakes and turkey and all the fixings and the kids were uh, uh, played throughout the, the major part of the hall they had a side room for the uh, the adult males. That was the card playing and the cigar smoking room. Forty-five was the game back then, much the way it is right now. And it ended with a uh, very large uh, sit-down meal for for anywhere from twenty to fifty. Or gosh, I can couldn't tell you how many were there any given time. In 1967, under the management of David Dorsey, the bank's vice president and cashier, and bank president Medford C. Locke, the first National Bank of Fort Fairfield, acquired the C.A. Powers Building next to the bank, which at the time was one of the largest wooden structures in town. The Powers Building was demolished the following year in order to provide a spacious parking lot for the bank's customers. The bank was also renovated to include a new teller line, a new loan office, and the first and only drive through teller's window in Fort Fairfield. In 1970, the First National Bank of Fort Fairfield became affiliated with Depositors Trust Company, with the board voting for an exchange of 100% of the bank's stock in exchange for Depositors Corporation shares. Five years later, the name was changed to Depositors Trust Company of Aroostook. David Dorsey became president of the bank at that time. In 1985, Key Corp bought Depositors of Aroostook and the name was changed to Key Bank of Northern Maine. David Dorsey remained there as bank president until 1989 when he left to form First Citizens Bank in Presque Isle. The building was sold to a private owner and Key Bank leased it until 2013 when they decided to close the bank and move its operations to their Presque Isle location. After sitting empty for two years, the interior of the bank is beginning to suffer from the effects of water and moisture damage. The large steel vault is developing surface rust and some of the interior walls are deteriorating. Fort Fairfield Chamber of Commerce Executive Director Tim Goff says they are aware of the damage and are working with the building owner to find a potential buyer to preserve the building. Well, you know, it's one of those things where you don't heat a building in Arusta County, that's going to lead to issues. And so ultimately, we believe that the, the main source of the water leak is a ledge that's only on that side of the building, the side that's closest to the post office. Um, and we believe it's as simple as sealing some of that with really like a, a rubber um, or an epoxy of some sort. Um, but ultimately, there's still going to be other issues with leakage around windows and seals. Uh, some of the windows on the top two floors are fairly old. And some of the brick, actually, the, the, the sills are pointed inward instead of sloping outward. Uh, in January, we started uh, to kind of kind of walk through it and kick the tires on it and take a look at it to try to figure out how we could help as a community position this building. Um, it's still private property. We don't own it. Um, and it's ultimately something that's going to take some investment. And so we've been trying to find creative solutions to try to keep it uh, and refabricate it into something that's more viable and modern. Um, it has some unique characteristics and has some unique challenges. And that's really the, the difficulty. Um, but really one of the things that I've wanted to do through this process is make awareness. You know, if people don't know that it's here and that it's in danger of being torn down, then maybe the right buyer doesn't come in or the right solution or the right idea that we could reformulate this with. And where it's being such a key, unique character piece in downtown, um, I think the, the universal sentiment is it would be a shame to lose it. But I think just after that, it becomes, what do you do with it? Uh, the price has been reduced. It's a very reasonable $69,000, but the, the price to buy it isn't so much the problem as it is the price to rehab it. Um, we believe uh, through our conversations with various contractors 
um, that the windows on the top two floors would have to be replaced, the bricks on probably all four sides would have to be repointed, and that the uh, ledge on one side of the building where the, the major leak of water has been uh, would need to be sealed and then the roof would need to be done. And then commence whatever you want on the interior because it's a it's kind of a blank canvas in a sense but at the same time has some real neat character pieces to it you know I would say out of about 50 people I've had through here uh, I would say 10 had very solid business credentials and ideas and a lot of the plans that they've come up with aligned with the ones that we came up with under the previous town manager and myself as we were looking at this building a little bit more closely um, with residential uses for the top two floors and some sort of mixed commercial or co-op use on the first floor. The town is definitely committed to helping somebody find whatever source of funding that we can and probably through various nonprofit entities be it USDA that helps with rural development in downtowns or downtown redevelopment or CBDG funds which are used for you know blighted areas we could consider this potentially a blighted building if we wanted to go through that process but all of those things obviously same with historical preservation come with caveats or conditions and so that's that's what makes it tough uh, for Fairfield has quite a bit of lower income housing a lot of CBDG funds go for LMI, low to mid middle income folks. If you wanted to do condos here, you couldn't use CBDG funds. You know, so it's it's always one of those things where you're like, ah, oh, we have this idea, can we find the right plan to help tailor it? And so we've reached out well beyond our borders and well beyond the borders of Maine and solicited quite a bit of information and feedback from them.